to Jamaica Live and this is News Update with me, Odera. How are you? This TGIF. I hope you're able to join into the conversation because there are a lot of juicy topics to talk about as we conclude this week. The blazing hot blazing story of yesterday that was all over the place um is about donna brazil's new tell all book now in her book um it is called the hack it's called Hacks, the inside story of the break-ins and breakdowns that put Donald Trump in the White House. Now, according to this book, according to this book and according to the expert that the excerpt of the book that was published in online on political news outlet, um, the Democratic National party, the DNC, um, rigged, had the election rigged in favor of Hillary Clinton. Now, Donna Brazil um, tells a story, the excerpt in political, it's, it's a very long article, it tells a story of how, first of all, she had promised candidate Bernie Sanders that she would mm -hmm. investigate if there was any wrongdoings if there was any shady dealings between the Democratic Party and the Hillary Clinton campaign. And of course, Donna Brazil is the former um, interim chairwoman of the Democratic National Committee. And um, so she had had a discussion with Senator Sanders saying that she would look into the situation as um, of course, Senator Sanders has always suspected and many of his supporters have always suspected that the um, the Democratic prim for a primary um, election was taken from him and handed over to Hillary Clinton quite unfairly. So she itemizes that um, there were some agreements that were signed between the DNC and some of Hillary's campaign organizations that were not illegal but looked unethical. Now she goes on to explain how uh, Obama had put the Democratic Party into debt, um, going into the range of about $24 million um, in debt. And to consolidate that debt, the Democratic Party decided to go into an agreement where Hillary Clinton took over that debt and of course had all the reins of power of how um, processes in the Democratic were going, Party were going to go on before even her nomination as the Democratic Party candidate. Now, um, this is a big revelation for everyone and it seems she has thrown the Democratic Party under the bus. Um, many people have felt like they knew this for the longest time, um, even Senator Elizabeth Warren in an interview with CNN, she was asked outrightly if she believed that um, it was rigged in favor of Hillary and she said outrightly yes, meaning that there was um, numerous counts of foul play, albeit not, um, not particularly legal, just unethical and probably just plain unfair for Bernie Sanders now for those that um, may not have followed the election. Bernie Sanders is an independent senator who um, joined the Democratic um, Party to run under their ticket for the presidential election. Now, on the West Coast, um, Senator Sanders is very popular. and uh, In fact, amongst many millennials, um, Senator Sanders was very popular and he seemed like a clear cut win for them, especially in the political climate that we, are, we were approaching um, leading up to the 2016 elections. <clears throat> uh, many millennials supported him through their support behind him. Hi, Stella, nice of you to join us through their support behind Bernie Sanders. And it was, it was incredible. Um, 
many people were particularly heartbroken when Bernie Sanders did not win the ticket. Some people felt um, offended when he actually threw his support behind Hillary Clinton. And everyone knew that something was up. It, it seemed rather fishy. So for Donna Brazil to come up with this book now, and this very telling excerpt, it does say a lot about um, how the DNC was operating. And it somehow puts credit on the fact that um, President Trump has been asking that Hillary be investigated. Now, we all know that the president um, refers to Hillary as crooked Hillary since um, the debates and um, throughout the time he's been tweeting, um, especially once this news came out, he did say that how is the Department of Justice not investigating the DNC and investigating Hillary Moore. So it does give credence to that rumor that the DNC is not particularly straightforward in the way it handles its business. And this is is um, a big revelation, very big. And um, now, um, background to Donna Brazil. Now, she's been a CNN political commentator for the longest time, but in 2016, CNN let her go when Hillary's emails were leaked, and it was leaked that Donna Brazil had shared the CNN sponsored debate questions with some friends of the Hillary campaign. So obviously if she's sharing it with people that are in cahoots with Hillary, those people would have forwarded the questions to Hillary's campaign and she would have been better prepared for that debate. So CNN fired her several times with her after that. It was quite embarrassing to know. So it's like, um, is this possibly her redeeming um, feed? Is this how she wants to go down? Um, that was, of course, an embarrassing situation. So um, is this how she's trying to get herself back in the ring by redeeming herself, by showing the world the little investigation that she um, supposedly did while she was acting as the interim chairwoman for the DNC? And um, it, it's quite interesting. Many people cannot wait for the book to be released. There should be more hacks, as the book is called, in there. If this excerpt is anything to go by of what Donna Brazil would be revealing in her book, um, needless to say that it's going to be a firecracker and it um, will be explosive. Um, I personally am interested in finding out um, how this affects um, the investigations, what the FBI, what um, what the um, authorities, how the authorities would go about investigating these claims and if any criminal charges can be brought against anyone within the DNC or the Hillary camp for any of the things Donna Brazil has pointed out now. It is very, very interesting. It's quite frustrating, I would say, because, um, so the, the article in Political, which is the excerpt from her book, says that she did call Bernie Sanders and relay this information and he asked what his chances were. So um, she said that um, she called him and she said that um, she found the cancer, but she will not kill the patient. Now, um, I'm very curious to know what exactly she meant by that. Is, um, is, Hillary, is Hillary Clinton? the cancer and uh, the DNC, the patient who she um, who she's saying she won't kill, kill I want to say in terms of put throw under the bus, which of course she has done now. If she has killed any patient and DNC is that patient, she has definitely done this now by blowing the top off of this huge um, agreement that went on under the table, that went on with that many people knowing, of course. Um, and so Bernie Sanders has known this information for a while. And he he has had a very large following. He, he should have known that his supporters would um, be all the way behind him. I, I'm very curious as to why he didn't do more to fight this. Of course, um, we all know the power that money has over people, especially with things um, concerning Washington, D.C. But... Um, I believe Senator Sanders had um, 
had something going for him that um, Hillary definitely did not have, which was um, the heart of the people. I believe if if it came down to it, the people would have done everything they needed to do to make sure that he could he was not fighting this alone and he could um, handle it properly enough. I believe um, I'm very confused. I would um, love to hear Bernie Sanders' side of this, and um, of course, his campaign manager was on CNN speaking about it, but did he really offer enough information of why this was not tackled? differently and there were many different ways that this could have been tackled and possibly prevented so that um, maybe we won't have a president trump in the white house um i'd love to see how this goes uh, in future i'd love to see hillary's reactions to this i'd love to see how this plays out um it's such a huge story i um I can't wait to hear more, honestly. I can't wait to hear more. And I can't um, wait to get my hands on that book, too. <laughs> I would possibly be reading that book as well. On to my second topic for today. Now, Miami firefighters. Six Miami firefighters have been fired after vandalizing a black colleague's um, locker and hanging a noose inside his locker above his family picture. Um, the the um, the head, the chief in charge of that fire um, firehouse said that the attack the incident was of a sexually explicit and racially um and racially offensive conduct and um it's worrisome now we know the the great work that firefighters put into their job we know that they go out there they're ready to um fight fires they're ready to save lives put their lives on the line to help others we know how much um hard it takes how much respect honor integrity goes into their profession but to hear that um these people that we respect so much these people that we look up to in times of trouble and times of danger these people that we basically depend on would do this to their own colleague a fellow firefighter with them in the same firehouse it, it it leaves much to be desired um and it shows it shows the growing um fire of racial tension in this country it um it's unsettling it's sad that this should happen and um i really wonder how we can deal with this in in a better way um it, it now an update from wednesday i did speak about um a jamaican freshman at the university of hartford that was being poisoned by her white roommate um she was not getting along with this roommate and she after a month and a half she moved rooms um, upon moving, she found out that her ex-roommate, the white girl, had um, posted on her Instagram that she had been poisoning the girl. She just did not like her and um, said some very explicit things that she was doing. And that was actually making her roommate sick. She was making this Jamaican girl sick. She had thrown the shoes that... Um, <clears throat> the doctor was not able to identify exactly what was wrong with her. Her throat was hurting. She was sick for weeks. She had no idea why, only to find out that this girl was basically endangering her life while living in the same room with her. Now, an update from that story is that now um, hate crime has been added to the charges against her, and the girl is no longer in the University of of Hartford, so at least um, we know that Jamaican girl is safe. Now, why I'm mentioning this is because of how often we are now hearing about racially motivated 
I want to say bullying. I want to call it bullying because they're not um, direct attacks, but they're racially motivated bullying. And I, I'm wondering what's causing this in our society today and what's causing it in such rapid rapid secession like one after the other um also this morning there was a report that a former new jersey police chief has been charged with hate crimes um they said there were many excuse me there were many complaints filed against him while he was a police chief that he used to use racially unacceptable language for um for suspects that they arrested and he used racial slurs at will and treated african americans differently um many their um reports that his colleagues were down of him complaining about black people going as far as comparing them to isis and saying that they were a problem, and um, you know, it's it says a lot that um, people in positions of power, people at um, positions where we are supposed to respect completely, where we're supposed to depend on, especially for safety, are behaving in this manner, and it says a lot about our country, where young children, young teenagers in college would also be subject to this type of behavior and um, this type of thinking. And, and I really wonder what more needs to be done that we no longer need this. And of course, it seems like it's medicine after death because the people that we're talking about are basically adults. Even the 18-year-old freshman in the U University of Hartford, if you're in college, you're basically an adult. And um, firefighters or policemen, they, they're definitely more than adults. So if this is the type of behavior that um, adults are having in 2017, what can we say about the children that they are raising? What can we say about the generations coming up? What image, what example is it setting for everyone around them? It, it, it's scary to think that this is the America of now, that there's such a large racial divide. Of course, the racial discrepancy has been there, but for there to be such a large racial divide that um, people are now openly showing their racial intolerance, it, it says a lot about the state of the country, and it is very scary, very worrisome, and can be done about it soon. I um I hope that it's something that can be fixed. I um I really don't um I really wonder about the ways that it can be fixed. Um race is a big issue in this um race is a big issue in this country. It's something that we've always um, had to deal with in America. And every day, instead of getting better, it seems like it's getting worse. There were reports of more of a White Lives Matter protest this week um, down South. And um, things got out of hand when um, they came across an interracial couple and everywhere around America, you, you just hear of uh, people showing their hate more and more. And um, it's very sad. It, it does um, worry me about the state of the nation, about the future of the nation, about um, where we're headed from here and um, how this can be curtailed and possibly help because um, racial hate is unnecessary. And, in this day and age, there are larger issues that we have to deal with in the world. You would think that um, racism and um, racial intolerance should be the last thing on our, everyone's mind. What should be on our minds is um, bringing the world together um, to peace, you know, not, not dealing with your colleagues trying to poison you 
or basically bullying you by hanging a noose. Now, um, to like to understand better, in case you don't understand exactly what that means, um, a noose is what was used during slavery to hang slaves. And um, when the KKK was operating um, violently back in those days, in the Jim Crow days, they would hang nooses in front of black families' houses as, um, as a threat, as a threat, as a warning that they would kill them, that they would hang them from a noose so to see that kind of i I don't know i don't think it can be called a joke it's to see that kind of threat that kind of message that kind of subliminal message left in a firefighter's locker in 2017 is absolutely scary and it is not something I want to hear more about ever. It it's it's disgusting, and I'm very very happy that um at firefighters those firefighters involved were fired for it, and um, more investigations are being done into that. The um the the chief of that firehouse said that they are racially diverse, and that sort of behavior would not be tolerated. So they're really going to the further ex furthest extent of the law to handle this situation. And I, I do hope it gets handled, but more than getting handled, I do hope that um, whatever issues get sorted out, like whatever would motivate someone to think of such a thing, to even think of that. And, and um, the picture of the, the firefighters that were fired was released and it's interesting to know that one of them is actually black I, I found that very interesting and um i can't i can't even think of an explanation as to why uh, an, a fellow black person would see his white colleagues um trying to leave a noose in someone's locker and um be okay with that why why would grown men anyway be okay with vandalizing someone's locker and drawing a penis on his wife's face? Like grown men um, behaving this this way, it's it's so worrisome. Um, I don't want to say like were they bored? Like um, were they not enough fires for them to put out? Um, it seems insensitive to say, but what what would cause them to use their free time to behave in this manner? <clears throat> it's not. It's really inexplicable. But I'm very happy that it is being handled, and I hope um, to hear more about how that's being handled very soon on to my next topic in ghana a 15 year old boy um graduated from high school and decided to develop an app to help data users in africa with their issues of internet data wastage now for those that are not familiar with the kind of mobile data we have to deal with in africa i will give you some background it sucks it is the worst internet on the face of the earth it is the slowest bandwidth the slowest mkb everything it is the worst to make it any better to get it at least to standard internet excuse me to get it at least to the standard of internet like the most basic standard you can find in the u.s would be super expensive in africa it it's unfair it, it's very unfair and um especially as Africa is getting more and more mobile, you know, 
um, you would think that um, it should be more accessible. So you see even villagers in villages with mobile phones that are um, have internet access, but they have to pay so much just to connect to the internet. And um, so that was the thinking of this boy. Now he's 15 years old, he just graduated from high school, he's waiting for his exam results. And in his free time, he realizes that he goes through data a lot. And this is not somebody that, of course, um, young, many young people do not um, have the opportunity to work in Africa. So he, um, is, he was trying to manage his data better, especially since he was basically on holiday and he realized that he kept burning out of it fast. And he devised, he started thinking of a way that um, he can be alerted as to what is wasting his data, how he can better manage it. So his older brother works with the tech firm and gave him the challenge of developing an app that could curtail their data wastage. And he did that. And I, I believe that's so impressive. Very impressive. Hi, Moral. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're enjoying, enjoying the conversation. I think it's so impressive that this young boy could um, sit and open his mind enough to develop something that could help others, especially in Africa. And, and it, um, it reminds me of in Nigeria last year, some students, <clears throat> some students built an electric powered car um, from, from scratch with locally sourced materials. Now, um, you would know that of course, pollution and uh, dumping and waste is a big problem in Africa. So to be able to put that waste to good use and make a car, it's a very innovative idea and um, could do wonders for the African nation. And for them to build a car with no help, that was very impressive. Also, um, earlier this year in May, um, there was a 14-year-old that graduated from college with a degree in physics. And um, it says a lot about our young generation. It shows that no matter where they are in the world, if given the opportunity to think outside the box, they think far and wide. Um, in Jamaica, there is a program that is in the second wave of second phase of development. Um, it is called the Alternative to Livelihood Skills Development Program. Now, um, it is um, it's launched by the Jamaica Social Investment Fund, which is under um, under the Ministry of funding. Um, it's under one of the ministries in Jamaica. Um, and this particular project is funded by the World Bank. And it is said to, it aims to train at least 400 Jamaican youth between the ages of 17 and 29 years old um, throughout the duration of the project. Now, it, um, it aims at giving them skills to uh, um, in communications and um, everything, everything you can think of that can have them empower themselves and find and develop possibly entrepreneurship opportunities for themselves or um, maybe legitimate side hustles, things that they can use to make a, a living for themselves, especially um, especially as a way of turning them away from crime. And I think it, it's, an, it's an amazing development for the Jamaicans. And um, it, it's very interesting for the Jamaican government to be a part of. And I believe the Jamaican government should support more projects like this and possibly make it as large as it can be to spread across all of Jamaica because uh, 400 youth is, is still 
little considering the number of youth that are in gangs or in get related in gang related violence or on the streets not in school not giving opportunities the uh, jamaican government should look into having more programs like this where um people are taken care of and i believe um african nations as well should have this sort of things where youths can invest their innovations in their energy their um clear thinking into something positive you know where they can concentrate where they can um concentrate on developing themselves and they're taking off the streets i think that's a, really the most important thing the, these children need to be taken off the streets and not taken out just taken off the streets for the sake of being taken off the streets but taken off the streets and put in places where they're um they're serving meaning to their lives and to their community so it, it it's not um it's not a wasted effort they're doing something that's going to positively affect their future and going to positively affect their community and um the Jamaican government african governments should realize that when they invest in the youth and children this way it is always for the benefit of the greater good of the entire nation of the entire community um one big thing that i know is a problem in nigeria our education system is basically whack they do not invest enough in the education system and at the end of every year you know when they're trying to hire people they complain that these um these graduates from college are not equipped with the skill they don't have basic learning skills and it's like well when you didn't properly fund the universities to give them that adequate training how do you expect them to now graduate and have the skills that make them employable so you see that more and more people have gone through school in Nigeria but are not employable because the the state of the schools is horrible horrible it's substandard it's not even up to any standard at all and it, and it's such a shame um our governments need to know that investing in education investing in skill development programs such as this one is for the benefit of the whole country and um excuse me it really makes politicians lives easier honestly if if every country has this sort of skill development program and um at least let's say every year 400 youth um between the ages of 17 and 29 years old are given the skills to develop in their lives skills that they could put to good use to make money now what happens the economy starts to grow because they're generating they're generating fund that's from basically new business that's just called the new businesses that's 400 new businesses that you're putting out there to make the economy grow then of course you are get, helping now whatever they're doing is definitely going to serve a certain good so for example if you train mechanics you have cheaper cheaper uh, labor mechanical labor so that uh, other mechanics can be cheaper and then you see that more cars on the road are fixed you know like less accidents less uh, everything is a cycle that affects each other so if the youth are better um are better armed with skills that can help them they will be less inclined to fall into crime and i believe that's the most important one engaging youths that um may not have had the opportunity to go to school or are not in school any longer and not doing anything rather than give them the opportunity to fall into crime it is so much better to give them skills that they can use to occupy their time even if they're just um you know doing carpentry and they're building things by themselves for for people to buy one day they're busy 
they're busy doing something and not ca causing havoc to the communities and to the population, you know. Um, then even politicians' lives will be safer. I mean, if there's less crime, there's no fear of armed robbery, there's no fear of, you know, anything happening. So these things affect us all. And our government should be more bothered about investing more and funding more of such projects and such programs and doing more of such programs. There are so many, so many such programs that can be undergone for their development and, and can help push Jamaica forward, push Africa forward in many different ways. And these are things that we need to pay more attention to collectively as citizens of these Black nations that we hope one day would be able to stand on their own and um, do better. Because, you know, like, um, like, like I mentioned on Wednesday, I, I hate the fact that... Um, European countries have to always be involved in our countries. Whenever we're, we're doing something, you always see that um, European country has some hand in it. If it's not the World Bank, it's IMF. If it's not IMF, it's UN. If it's not UN, it's Red Cross. You know, they're always doing something in our countries um, for us. And it's like, uh, we... We fought for independence. We said that we could stand independently. So why are we not in, independent? Oh, why do we say we are independent, but we are not actually because we have the backing of these um, foreign funded organizations? When um, the hurricanes happened here in the US and Houston was affected and Florida was affected, I did not see any foreign organization um, raising funds for them. They were all US based, all the US government, um, all US, e everything American was concerned about providing relief for those affected by the hurricanes. Came in to offer help or assistance or sort things out for the Americans. The Americans handled it by themselves. So when will we get to that point where we have a crisis, which is youth unemployment, youth inactivity, youth um, basic miscreancy all over the place. We have a crisis and uh, when can we get to the point where we have a crisis and we can handle it by ourselves? Um, it, it's still, it's like I said, it's still embarrassing that we have to depend on foreigners to help us get in line. So why then are we independent? And are, are we really independent if we have to have the World Bank fund everything? I don't know, my opinion. Um, moving on. So now this, is a really funny one to me. Um, it seemed interesting. Have you ever wanted to like, um, have you ever left a job and you wanted to like push things down or throw up all the papers, you know, just to let them know you're gone? Um, that's what a Twitter employee did on um, he or she's last day of work. They deactivated President Trump's Twitter account. Now, President Trump does not tweet from the official presidential handle. He tweets, he tweets from his personal Twitter, which he has been using to wreak um, large amounts of havoc on the Twitter sphere before he even became president. And of course, since becoming president, that has not stopped in the least, um, much to the chagrin of many Twitter users and many of his, um, many that don't agree with him. Um, so yeah, this Twitter employee was leaving last day of work and they deactivated Trump's account for 11 minutes. Um, Trump's response to that was that it seems that his message is getting out and um, 
he's making impact <laughs> if somebody um, was forced to delete him. And um, it's that's pretty scary um, if that's the impression that President Trump got from his account being deleted. But um, I think it was funny. Many people were very excited about that. They, um, they did cheer on the employee and um, Twitter, of course, released a statement to apologize for it and um, said that they're investigating the matter, looking into the matter before they came out with the story that it was an employee that was already on his way out the door and that was his uh, last bye-bye to the Twitter sphere, which many people um, basically enjoyed. <laughs> uh, remember, you can jump to the conversation. You can talk with me, share what you like, comment on any of my topics, um, give me your side of the story, um, update me if there's any more news that I haven't gotten around to share something you want me to talk about, talk more about a topic. Um, your screen. Also, if you would like to speak with me, you can call that number, which is right here on the screen. Um, if you're in the end, number straight. Now, feel free to call me on WhatsApp, and I will, and then we will talk. We'll have a conversation. So I'm gonna give a rundown of these topics once again. Starting from the beginning, um, I feel this was this was a burning hot story. This, uh, honestly, um, everywhere I went yesterday, everyone was talking about this. Um, so, former interim chairwoman Donna Brazil, interim chairwoman of the DNC, Donna Brazil. She released an expert. Now, she, Politico, the news outlet Politico, published an excerpt from her new book that's said to be released this month of November um, called Hacks, the Inside Story of the Break-Ins and Breakdowns that Put Donald Trump in the White House. Um, that's the name of her book, and um, Politico published an excerpt yesterday uh, from the book that detailed, that told the story of a conversation between her and Bernie Sanders about how the election was, the Democratic primary election was rigged in favor of Hillary Clinton. Now, this is a big expose because, number one, she's so close to the Democratic Party that um, obviously this is valid information and, and she gives context clues. She gives so much, she has the receipts. Um, she throws everybody under the bus. She mentions how Obama left the party in debt. She mentions how um, basically Hillary's campaign was, um, how basically Hillary's campaign was running the show. Um, and this this is an expert um, from, this is basically from the beginning of the article. You know, she said, before I called Bernie Sanders, I lit a candle in my living room and put on some gospel music. I wanted to center myself for what I knew would be an emotional phone call. Now, um, I, I love the way it was written because she started with this line and then goes on, you know, to give backstory of the supposed investigation. Now, according to this excerpt from her book, she says that she had promised Senator Sanders that she would investigate into whether any shady business is going on in the Democratic Party concerning their elections. And unfortunately, she did uncover something. Now, she uncovered agreements between the DNC and Hillary's, um, many of Hillary's um, fundraising organizations that basically um, had them clear the DNC's debt in, in exchange for full reign of the party. 
Now, this was a year before Hillary Clinton had even gotten the Democratic Party um, primary ticket. She had it, she wasn't on the ticket yet, but this was already a signed agreement. And um, Donna Brazil said that when she saw it, it definitely was not illegal, but it did seem unethical. And um, I would add, it was definitely unfair to Bernie Sanders to have him in the party like that when um, when they knew that he basically stood no chance. Now, what, what was very interesting to me was that um, when she said she called, she finally spoke to Bernie Sanders, she said, I have found the cancer, but I will not kill the patient. Now, I, I would love to know more about what that statement means. So is the cancer the agreement that they have been looking for, like some telltale sign that says, yes, these people are up to no good? And um, is the patient the DNC? Or is the t patient Hillary Clinton? Like, those are some questions I want to ask. Hopefully in the book that is answered. I, I, I'm sure that there will be more uproar when the full book is finally published for to have. I know many people are pre-ordering it. And of course, um, Donald Trump, President Donald Trump went to Twitter to, um, he had kind of like an aha moment, like, Haha ha, was right and tweeting asking how this was not being investigated and and I'm um I'm interested to know under what circumstances this can lead to a criminal investigation. You know, um I am not familiar particularly with the parameters under which the DNC is governed, but if Donna Brazil could say it was not illegal but definitely unethical it does, you know, put up a lot of warning bills, a lot of red flags going up on there. Um, I'm also curious as to why Bernie Sanders knew this. And for the type of politician that he um, he displayed himself to be, it seemed that this would have been an issue that he should have taken on um, more strongly, that he should have addressed strongly more strongly when he had the chance. And uh, number one, I'm, I'm actually surprised that he stuck with the Democratic Party. I would believe someone like Senator Sanders would um, set his standard and not join um, a party that he didn't too much trust to begin with, especially if he had already Ask Donna Brazil to make some investigation into the situation. It showed that he barely had any trust for the party which we, with which he wanted to run under. And that says a lot that he still stayed, that he even threw support behind Hillary and all that. It, um, it's very unsettling. And um, there, need, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered. And um, I can't wait to hear everyone's reaction to this. No. Notably, notably, the three major channels, ABC, NBC, CBS, did not cover this breaking news. Now, every other news station, oh, I'm getting a call. Oops, someone is calling. Hello. Every other news station, I'm getting a call. Hello. 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 Hi. Yeah, this is Madison again. Hi, Madison. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, I just want to comment on this Bernie story of not responding. Bernie knew what was happening. He literally knew. He had an unfair chance of getting the nomination. So why did he continue? Why did he take why did he take money from people knowing that he would not have gotten the nomination? Definitely. Definitely. I mean 
I personally have donated three times to the Bernie campaign. Okay. I never was shocked that he lost California because I spoke to people in California and I knew he had the support in California. So I was literally shocked when he lost California. And I was more angry with Bernie. I'm angry because Bernie just kind of stayed with the Democratic Party and pretend nothing happened. Like, exactly. It doesn't make any fool. That that was that's my same um question if he knew this so early why why did he stay on um i i i'm surprised he even joined them to begin with but after getting this information you would think that he would um he would disassociate himself with them i mean he, we don't even hear him speak after this, this this is massive it's huge it's the smoking gun we all knew this had happened we knew this and bernie still not even speak he's still quiet like he doesn't make any sense it do not make any sense to anybody nobody can literally make sense of what is happening that he know is you know he, 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 he had no chance of winning this uh, nomination he, he still pretended like he, he could have won he took a lot of money he's just quiet like so, I mean, let me ask you, Madison. There, there's yeah. um, there were some reports that um, in some of the leaked emails that it was um, there was an email that said that somebody should remind Bernie um about the agreement. Do you think it's possible that Bernie was also giving money for um his silence, possibly? Um, you know, <laughs> some people ask him, was Bernie a mole? You know. Okay. I mean, like, come on. I mean, like, I mean, it's not far fetched now, knowing that we all know now that Bernie knew he had no chance. Let, let me read what you have on your screen. Donna Brazil said, Before I called Bernie Sanders, I lit a candle in my living room. I put some gospel music. I wanted to send to myself for I knew it would be it would be an emotional phone call. So she herself knew she was heartbroken. I think in in the same excerpt she said she cried after she hung up the phone with Bernie. So she herself was bawling because she knew and Bernie just pretend like okay fine like come on yeah i think bernie i think after this bernie need to give us answers he has bernie cannot be quiet anymore he has he must answer questions about this he can't be quiet okay let me ask you madison if um if you had the opportunity to question bernie sanders what questions would you ask him concerning this issue I would have said, Mr. Sanders, you knew you had, you haven't got a chance in the hell of getting the nomination. Why did you continue to pretend like you do when you know that the Hillary campaign, according to Donna Brazil, are taking over the Democratic Party? There was no Democratic Party. There was none. It was the Hillary Clinton campaign. It, that's what Donna Brazil says. It, it, that's what she says. No campaign. It was it was all a sham, basically. Definitely. It was, it was a sham. So I would ask Bernie Sanders, tell me why did you take where is the money anyway? Where's all this money? Mm-hmm. 
Because he got a lot of money, you know. He's, he got a lot of money from people. So where did, where's all this money? I mean, people were on the internet asking for their money back. Rightfully so. Now people know that he knew that he had no chance in hell of winning the nomination. So, I mean, everybody would want Delisa $27 back. Because apparently he, he got $27. That was uh, the average he got from everybody. I mean, Bernie need to speak up. He need to come out. He need to say something. He need all the people who have given our heart and soul for this man. He need we he owe us to speak him out and say something. He cannot sit by and be quiet. Yeah, that's what I would say. Okay. Basically. Thank you so much for your contribution. You seem very passionate about this. I'm glad that I had you on. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. I, yeah, I couldn't wait to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you. Have a Bye. nice evening. Bye. Bye. Yeah. So, um, that was definitely a Bernie Sanders supporter, um, our frequent caller, Madison. And, um, she seems pretty upset. Like, like I said, um, why would Bernie Sanders hear this? And, um, given the type of politician he displayed himself as, it just seems uncharacteristic of him to remain silent to take this sitting down like um he didn't strike us as a person that was inactive and um he had a very good um policy line now he 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 was someone you could basically see through so it's it's unlike him and i hope he does speak out like my listen said i hope he does give the people some answers because the people want to know I hope he does give some answers and I hope we are able to um, hear more about this story. I would also love to hear what Hillary would have to say about this as well. Um, moving on, um, a 15 year old in Ghana developed an app to help um, data users in Africa with their issues of internet mo uh, mobile data. Now, um, background on how mobile data is used in Africa. First of all, it sucks. It's horrible. It's the slowest, most expensive in the world in terms of internet, and um, it's no good whatsoever. And you find that um, when your mobile data is on, much of it goes to waste. So very innovative that this boy, <coughs> obviously seeing, <coughs> excuse me, obviously seeing that his um, data was running out faster than it should have been, um, decided to develop an app that would help him monitor his data usage and stop him from wasting it at all. So it goes to what he needs it to go to. And um, <clears throat> this is very innovative for Africans, I'm sure many people would be interested in using it and I'm sure it would help the way um, data is used in Africa, help the way data is managed in Africa so we don't, um, many Africans don't end up spending so much money on data every month. <clears throat> Which brings me to um, a program that is in the second cycle of its run. Um, now, the Jamaican Social Investment Fund in Jamaica has launched the second cycle of this alternative livelihood skills program. Now, the program is said is supposed to um, train at least 400 Jamaican youths between the ages of 17 and 29 years old in many different skills from um, cooking and engineering skills, um, communication, IT, tech skills, things that they can get them, keep themselves busy with so that they stay out of trouble. Now, um, I believe, especially for youths like the 15 year old in Ghana that developed this app, these sort of programs would help them develop their innovation more to better affect their communities and their nations which of course are developing nations, if these youth are putting in their, uh, <clears throat> their skills that have become livelihoods into back into the um, community, it will help where they're living and it will be to their benefit. So I believe the Jamaican government should be involved in more of such projects and many African 
governments as well should look into livelihood skill development programs just like this one to keep youth off the street better engaged and to have their minds working on where it should be working at and of course um, my last topic for the day is that trump's account was deleted now um, a twitter employee on their last day of work deleted trump's account for 11 minutes and um, caused quite an uproar on Twitter. Twitter, of course, said that they were investigating. The letter apologized when they found out it was an employee that they could not fire because the person was already leaving. But it was quite interesting to know. So this has been a very wonderful session of Jimmy Make a Life um, news update with me. Odera, your host. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Please keep in touch. Send me messages on WhatsApp. Comment on this video after it's been saved. Um, <clears throat> you know, join the conversation even after it's ended. Uh, feel free to send a message. Let me know what you want me to talk about on Monday next week coming up. Um, we have a lot of, we have a very special show coming up soon. So stay tuned for next week, Friday. You don't want to miss it. Happy TGIF, everyone. I'm still Adira. Till next time. Bye.